Hello, everyone. I'm Ted Oakley, Managing Partner at Oxbow. And as always every year, I'm glad to have David Rosenberg. David is the founder and president of Rosenberg Research and Associates. And I would highly recommend to you, if you've never looked at his service, that you take a look at it. I think he is easily one of the most knowledgeable and certainly the most information of anybody I ever see on the street. But David, and I'm not going to tell all the background on you because you've had so much experience. I would be here all day, but how are you doing today? Glad to have you. Uh, well, it's uh, great to be on again, uh, Ted. Uh, looking forward to seeing you in Colorado. And uh, it's always uh, an education for me being with you as well. So uh, encouraging that we have this uh, symbiotic relationship. Yeah, for sure. We both presented this symposium, and I always tell David, hey, you intimidate me with all your information." But, but anyway, <laughs> David, let's talk about uh, let's talk about where the consumer. You know, everybody's talking about the consumer these days, and we. Uh, what do you What do you think about the consumer? Well, I want to hit off Ted with uh, all the enthusiasm and excitement that came out of the uh, December retail sales number, which of course shot the lights out. Uh, that. Um, it was uh, the warmest December, uh, and, and I guess we can get into a uh, discussion on climate change if you want. But <laughs> it was the war It was forty degrees on average uh, through the U.S. in December, uh, and uh, normally a December's thirty three degrees. It was a two and a half standard deviation event in terms of the balminess. So the problem with the all the data, uh, whether it's housing, uh, retail sales, uh, employment, which all has you know um, caused everybody to think, well, the Fed's not going to cut rates anytime soon because look at the data. Uh, the December data that had this glow uh, was a weather report because you know these numbers are all seasonally adjusted to make them comparable. But you know when you get March weather in December, it creates um, a wonky headline. On all the data, uh, after the government statisticians apply their seasonal adjustment. Well, and you have so this. Uh, would, you have a chart, though, David, on uh, talking about buying plan, auto plan, buying plan, yes, home buying yes. plan for consumers. I, Not too great. And, no, and so then, and that's I think the major point here is that, you know, we we had a 2023 where there was still a lot of. Uh, um gas left in the tank when it came to the fiscal stimulus um and it uh impeded what the fed had already done in terms of the most aggressive tightening cycle since the volcker years um the lags from what the fed's done still uh lie ahead of us but there isn't going to be much in the way of any fiscal stimulus this coming year notwithstanding the fact that we have an election in november so quite right that when you look at these uh, consumer sentiment indicators and they ask the question, uh, you know, what are you planning on doing over the next six months? And you take a look at whether it's uh, big ticket uh, furniture appliances or it's homes or it's autos, um, they're scaling levels that we have seen at the depths or worse than the depths of the past six recessions. Oh, yeah. So, your, your, your slide yeah. uh, that says memo to Jay Powell, uncle. Are yeah. those two things you just mentioned? Well, you know, the thing is that, I, I, you know, Jay Powell said something um, last fall, you know, when they were actually very hawkish uh, in September. Of course, they've become less hawkish since. But he, he was asked a question at the podium after the FOMC meeting in September whether or not he thought that the Fed was overly restrictive. And he says, oh, no, no, uh, I don't think we're overly restrictive at all. And so what's interesting is that in that University of Michigan sentiment, you know, which goes all the way back about 70 years. It's a really terrific, let's just say anecdotal or, or, or soft piece of data, but it's a very interesting survey uh, on behavior. So they asked the question uh, to the consumers, so what's the reason why you're pulling out of the market for autos and for homes and for big ticket durable goods? Now, six to 12 months ago, uh, it would have been, well, inflation. Those are prices are just too punishingly high, but that's been replaced by interest rates. So now you have a situation where interest rates are public enemy number one. So here you have Jay Powell saying, oh, no, we don't think we've over tightened. And then, you know, the 70 percent of the economy called the consumer is screaming uncle, saying that uh, I'm pulling back on my future expenditures because the cost of credit is just simply too high. And in fact, when you look at the chart, you'll see that uh, indeed, you know, we have a central banker, Jay Powell, who spent most of the cycle comparing himself to Paul Volcker. And so yeah. the 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 um, 
the index that is showing, you know, that we're not going to buy anything because interest rates are just too damn high, it is back to those levels that we had with Paul Volcker. Uh, so I just find it very interesting. It's actually a very good um, indicator. And why we started turning more bullish on fixed income was because when you get to that degree of people lamenting and complaining about interest rates, you know that the peak is in. Well, and you've, you've got two great slides on how quickly inflation has come down from that level. You have two super slides on that. Right. Yeah. It's uh, Well, I think it's only happened a handful of times in the past that inflation, I mean, we peaked at 9.1. We're down to in the low threes uh, in less than a year and a half. And um, that's only happened a handful of times in the post-World War II period. And guess what? It, it all happened in and around economic recessions, recessions that nobody sees coming. Um, but quite right. It was a, um, look, it, it's, it's been largely like we're not back to two percent, Ted. However, uh, you know when you think about going from two uh, and then up to nine and then back to three, I mean we're ninety percent of the way there. And uh, quite right that uh, it's been very quick, uh, almost as quick as the run up to nine percent. Uh, so uh, I don't I don't think I'm going to take a victory lap only because I was brought up well. However, I think that those of us that were saying transitory, um, you know, what was transitory? What is the time dimension of transitory, Ted, as we have found out, 18 months? Yeah. That's the time dimension. So in the overall annals of economic history, I would say that uh, that's pretty transitory. So, David, let me ask you a question on that. I know you feel like we're going back to low levels of inflation within the next 12 months from, your, from reading what you put out. But let me ask you this question. Look at the next 10 years. Do you think we're going to be in a period much like the 70s where, yeah, you came down to low inflation, then you go back up, back down, back up? Do you think we're back to that or something different? I think it's going to be radically different. And, you know, I get the comment all the time, Ted, about uh, the 1970s. And even uh, some Fed officials say that they're reluctant to ease policy prematurely because of the fear that they're going to reignite uh, inflation. And what I don't understand is, why is everybody so fixated in the 1970s? Uh, I mean, the Fed cut interest rates dramatically, and this was actually under Paul Volcker in the mid-1980s. Did inflation return? No. Alan Greenspan cut rates pretty aggressively in the mid to late uh, 1990s after the 1994 tightening cycle. He cut rates. Did inflation come back? No. Even Jay Powell. Jay Powell unexpectedly cut rates three times in 2019 before COVID. Did inflation come back in 2019? No. So nobody ever talks about, well, the mid 80s or the mid 90s or the last experience in 2019. Uh, I'd say that the economy, you can argue that a lot of things changed um, post COVID and we're in a really a, a much higher level of geopolitical tensions, that much is sure. But what does this economy have in common with the 1970s? The 1970s, uh, was there generative AI in the 1970s? Was there technology? There was no productivity growth in the 1970s. I mean, technology in the 1970s was a transistor radio. Uh, and the reason why inflation was pernicious in the 1970s to a large extent was because we had very vibrant demographics. The median age of the population was 28, not 38. And you had an absolute boom in uh, dual incomes, the surge in female participation rates that added a ton of income uh, to the household sector. Uh, and you had tremendous household formation and family size. I mean, you're taking a look today, you look at average family size, you're taking a look at people getting married later, having their kids later, average family size dramatically lower. Um, so the demographics from a demand aspect and, you know, I think that as our friend uh, Lacey Hunt always says, demographics is destiny. Well, the demographics are far, far less inflationary than we were back then. You know, when you're taking a look, for example, at foreign competition, and right now we're, we're not talking about a decline in foreign competition. We're talking about really shifting supply chains from unreliable areas like China to, say, uh, you know, more uh, friendly areas, and it's called French shoring in places like Mexico uh, and even uh, Japan. So we're reshifting supply chains, but competition globally is at a completely hmm. different level today uh, than it was back then. We're taking a look at import penetration in the United States from abroad, import competition to local producers hmm. 
said, it's it's ten times more intense than it was back then. And you know, we we heard all the all about the return of labor power and uh, post COVID and so on and so forth. And you had if it's not Starbucks here, it's American Airlines there mm-hmm. about uh, the strikes and these wage settlements. But the the unionized wage sector was like thirty percent of the labor force back in the seventies. It's six percent today. Yeah. So back then, you know, inflation was really more institutionalized. Uh, and so I'm not going to say that in the next 10 years, we're going to have sustainable lower inflation. I think we can debate that. I mean, 10 years is going a long way out. But I will, I have been, and I will continue to push back against this view that we're going to return anything close to the 1970s. And you you have uh, one of the great slides you have, too, talking about inflation and where we are is on what goes into the CPI. Uh, yeah. You know, most people don't know, but you have a great at showing that uh, obviously rents are a big, big factor. Yeah, uh, rents are a third of the CPI, 40% of the core CPI, and uh, that is the last man standing in terms of looking at these components, but it's so dominant. So you see, because uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uses what's called these distributive lags, um, which run three years, they're still including all the big rental inflation we had three years ago and two years ago. They're still in the data. And they, over time, they'll fall out of the data. But if you remember in that period, there was no uh, apartment building construction going on, uh, but yet the rental demand didn't go away. And we had a sharp decline in vacancy rates, a big boom in the rental rates. Uh, that is still seeping into the CPI. Uh, so you have this unusual dichotomy where the year-over-year percent change in the rental components of the CPI are running north of 6%. Uh, remember, and it's over 30% of the headline index. But when you look at real-time rents, uh, right. not what already happened in the past, but happening right now, uh, rents have been declining sequentially five months in a row. They're actually running negative 1% year-over-year. This is one of the great divergences, is that real-time, the CPI is ru- the, the rental components in real-time and the high frequency data are running negative one and the CPI running plus six percent. But you see over time, and this might not happen till the end of the year, uh, the CPI data on rents will ultimately converge on what's happening in real time. So you can imagine what happens if you go from six percent plus on a third of the index to minus one. Uh, I mean, you're going to end up taking about uh, two and a half percentage points off the headline inflation rate. So unless something else really nasty happens, you're talking about inflation. This is not on the market. Inflation going down to a fraction of 1% by the end of the year. Well, I know you have in there. A fraction of 1%. And you have in there that if you strip out shelter, even now, it's only one and a half. If you take shelter out. Take take shelter out. It's running uh, one and a half. Uh, And look, we we just got, uh, you know, the producer price index, which by the way, people say to me, well, you know, the PPI, it doesn't include services, it's just goods. No, 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 that's that, that that's your father's and grandfather's PPI. The PPI today does have services in it, um, but the services are not rents. The services mostly are transportation services, which bulk large in the PPI. So you look at the year-over-year percent change in the PPI, and it's running barely above 1%. Uh, so, you know, so, uh, so pick your poison. But I would say that, um, you know, look, uh, obviously, if you're buying TIP securities, Uh, They're hitched off the CPI, and the CPI is still viewed as the big mama out there as far as the inflation numbers we looked at. It's a very flawed statistic. But when you're taking a look at rent, or you're taking a look, just look at producer prices. By the way, producer prices leads consumer prices, and we're already down almost 1% on that metric. So I am very comfortable, once again, pushing back again against um, this uh, relentless inflation view that's still out there uh, on the street. So let me switch gears with you and talk about the bond market a little bit. And particularly, if you look at, you've got a great graph of the curve inversion that it's only there for 15% of the time. And uh, I'm I'm in the same camp with you. People, you know, they they sort of throw that off as, oh, it's not going to work this time. But it hasn't it worked most of the time that you go into recession with an inverted curve? Only time that it doesn't work, for example, Ted was in... Uh... Say 1998, when we rallied into the inversion. I mean, back in 98, after long-term capital and the the last leg of the Asian financial crisis, mm-hmm. the Fed, under Greenspan, cut rates three times. The curve inverted briefly, but there was no recession. What's 
the hundred percent scorecard for the yield curve is when the Fed raises rates after the yield curve flattens. So the Fed is continuing to raise rates with an inverted yield curve. That has a hundred percent recession signal. Uh, so yeah, why would you want to bet against that? But you see, uh, I get the comment all the time that you know, well, where's this recession already? It's like waiting for uh, for Gatto. Uh, Gatto doesn't show up at the end of the Beckett story, but uh, I think that uh, I don't believe the, the business cycle has been repealed. I just believe that the lags are, are very long. The, the lags are the lags are long, longer, and they were long back in that last cycle in 07 because of the last the tail end of the uh, of the housing boom. People were still extracting, uh, you know, equity out of their homes, mortgage equity withdrawals, cash out refinancings until they couldn't do it any longer. Next thing you know, the recession that everybody was saying wasn't going to happen in 07, all of a sudden, we're caught in the worst recession in the post World War II period in 2008. There's just lags. And this time around, it wasn't about extracting home equity. It was about the fact that we still had lingering, very significant fiscal stimulus in 2023 that's not being repeated. But the, that's the major point is that, um, you know, and they did they did this in uh, in 2000. They did this in 1989. They did this in 07. Uh, just people are so tempestuous and impatient. The recession's not here, therefore it's not going to happen. You know, it's like it's like me sitting in my perch in Toronto saying, you know, it, it, it didn't snow in December in Toronto, Canada. Therefore, the recession, the winter's been called off. <laughs> um, the, the the it typically takes a couple of years. Uh, and uh, the yield curve uh, started to invert in the summer of 2022. So I think that by, you know, I say the, the this quarter or next, I think we'll start to see the, the recession start to become a lot more evident. And, and I think given where everybody's positioned and the narrative of an elongated soft landing, I think the surprise will be the other way. Because it's interesting, uh, you know, you know this and you put out great work on this, but the average person has no idea of how much the government stimulated everything in 23, including non-farm payrolls. Yeah, the um, yeah, most people don't know that two-thirds of the growth, two-thirds of the economic growth. In other words, we had 6% nominal GDP growth last year, 4%, or I should say, yeah, 4%, 4, 4 percentage points, or two-thirds of that growth was from fiscal stimulus. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I would say that that's something that I underestimated going into the year and, and all these industrial subsidies and uh, the last vestige of uh, the stimulus checks juicing up the consumer had a very had a very significant impact on the economy. I mean, when you strip out the fiscal side and you just look at the economy organically outside of government, uh, we had we had basically call it, uh, you know, one percent real growth last year. That's what the emperor looks like disrobed. And uh, I think that, you know, once we get, I'm not going to call it distortions because government is part of the economy. It's not part of the private sector, mind you. Uh, and the fiscal stimulus is going to be subsiding this year rather dramatically. What, what lies ahead of us are the ongoing lags from the damage the Fed has already done. And you mentioned, too, in that same area about the uh, looking at bonds and this interest rate Fed thing, you have a great slide that goes back, I guess, 60 years, actually, showing that. This is the first time you've had, what, a three-year poor period here, at least two and a half years of where bond returns are in sort of, you call it an epic three-year slide. Yeah. Well, we uh, we had the rally towards the end of the year, so we did uh, manage to uh, escape having negative three years in a row, just fractionally, but this was actually the past three years, one of the worst periods on record uh, for the treasury market. Of course, we started this at least in the 1970s and those uh, cyclical bear markets and treasuries, you had a coupon to skate you on side uh, as you had the uh, the price decline uh, in those bonds. This time around, we started off at a fraction of 1%, for example, in the 10 year note. So you had no, didn't take much of a move up in yields to generate uh, those you know paper losses. So yeah, it was a um, you know I, I think I have in that uh, in the slides that you know how do you want to look at this? It's funny that you know the treasury market came perilously close to three straight years of negative declines in total return, and everybody says get out of bonds, abandon the bond market. But yet you know when we had three years of negative returns in the equity market in twenty twenty. 
uh, in 2000, 2001, 2002, it, 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 along the way, everybody's saying, buy the dips, buy the dips, buy the dips. But I would say this much, that if you were to say uh, three years of declining total returns and equities, it doesn't get worse from here. And you were saying that to yourself at the end of 2020, at the end of 2002, excuse me. Think of what the market did in the past five years. It doubled. So this goes to show that, uh, you know, equity markets get radically oversold at the lows, especially after negative returns for three years. And the same is true for bonds. And, you know, you two things going on right now, and I see this too, where if you look at, uh, it's, it's sort of both sides, you've got the street and hedge fund, everybody's long these stocks, particularly the big seven, and they're short. The bonds, all-time record short the bonds. They think the bond market's going to get hit hard. It almost seems like they're both on the wrong side <laughs> of this yeah, trade. It, well, that's a, and people tend to forget that, um, you know, sh uh, short squeezes can represent significant buying power. And everybody is still, it, it's incredible that we've even had this 100 basis point move down in treasury yields. Uh, and yet uh, most uh, investors in the futures and option pits are still, uh, net short um, uh, the ten-year Treasury note, um, you know, tells you just how negative the sentiment really is. So there's dramatic positive sentiment in equities. I mean, we saw that up until recently in every single survey, but... Market Vein, uh, Investors Intelligence. Well, there's an oxymoron for you. Uh, the AAII <laughs> survey. Uh, the uh, but yeah, the, the 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 well, it's just like you know the question you asked me before, Ted, about uh, 1970s. Uh -huh. I'm feeling those questions all the time. Yeah, uh, and there's this view that the economy is not going to go into recession because we haven't seen it yet. Um, we've already come down over 100 basis points. Uh, mm -hmm. The bond market seeing so seeing something out there, but yeah, and I, I'm a look. I, I'm a contrarian to a T, mm -hmm. and the sentiment on and positioning on Treasuries is actually bullish from a contrary perspective. Well, and and the other thing that you put in there on your slide is that the average decline uh in basis points from the fed after you know is 500 base when they cut they cut on average about 500 basis points which would take us back to a half if that was the case well that that's under the proviso that we have a recession yeah which nobody believes is going to happen uh, i don't believe that the business cycle has been repealed and i don't believe that mother nature has died a sudden death yeah um, so if we go into recession 500 basis points down, that's like, uh, that always happens with a very tight standard deviation. Um, and even if we don't get the recession and we luck into this elongated soft landing or some sort of landing that doesn't include a hard landing, think of where we have to go just to get to neutral, just to get the, the Fed through it, all of this, COVID, supply disruptions, everything else, uh, government debt, the neutral rate. Is still two and a half percent nominal. Funds rate is five and a quarter, five and a half. So I would posit that even if we don't get a recession, just to eliminate all the Volcker esque excess monetary restraint in the system, just to get to neutral, the Fed's got to cut rates 300 basis points from where we are today. Now, they don't want to do it that quickly, and they're vocalizing that. I say the longer they wait, the more they're going to have to do. But I'm more interested in the end point than I am as to whether it's going to be March or May. But you're talking, Ted, it's a it's a perfect layup. It's either 300 basis points or it's 500 basis points in terms of the decline in the funds rate. And that steepens the curve, brings it back to where it normally is. As you mentioned, 85% of the time we're positively sloped. That's just the time value of money at work. That's what you learn in your CFA courses. The curve will de-invert and the whole curve will shift lower which brings me to this once that happens uh we're talking about the stock market and but right now you have a really great graph on equity risk premium and just for those people that don't know what that is it's where you take the basically the earnings yield the sp and subtract the 10-year yield right <clears throat> and uh i guess it's almost zero in other words, well, it's a, the bond. Yeah, it, it depends. Well, uh, you know, right right now it's close to 100 basis points. Uh, it depends on what valuation metric you look at for the stock market. Mm -hmm. 100 basis points. What's what's the norm? As uh, you know, we invoke Bob Farrell's 10 market rules to remember rule number one 
uh, that markets tend to revert to the mean over time. Normally, normally the equity risk premium, which is what investors normally get compensated for to take on the equity risk in the S&P 500, is closer to three to 400 basis points. We're at 100 basis points. This is over a two standard deviation event. Uh, so my premise is, as you just said, is that um, investors right now, I think uh, unwittingly, are paying to take on equity risk instead of getting paid to take on equity risk. So I take a look at this, uh, it's a mean reverting series. And what it is suggesting to me in terms of the asset mix recommendation is that you want to be more in bonds as an asset class at this stage than equities. And if for people there that believe that 47, 4,800 is their estimate of whatever fair value is for the S&P 500, for you to believe that and make the math work, the 10 year note would have to be down to one, one and a half percent, you know? Uh, and so it's just, it's just, it's just basically, it's not a forecast, it's pure math. Look, and if, if you're saying to me that, oh, well, I think that treasury yields will just, you know, maybe get to three, three and a half percent, well, to equilibrate, the equity market and make it make sense, the S&P would have to go down another 20% from here, which won't feel too good. So it's just basically, I think that the, the math from a relative valuation perspective, Ted, the math, and notwithstanding how great the stock market's done from the nearby uh, October lows of last year, I think that the math is very daunting for 2024. Well, and what I hear you saying is, if I if I'm, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I'm I'm thinking I'm hearing you saying this. Basically, a stock market down, bond market up, in terms of pricing. That's uh, well, that is what makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't when I write, I don't tell people what to do. Uh, you know, I'm a I'm a cog in their investment decision wheel. I do tell them though what I am doing, what I'm comfortable doing. Uh, with uh, the investments at Rosemary Research and my family's investments and. Uh, we um, are tilting more in the way of uh, the treasury market and, and taking profits in equities at these relative valuations, not just relative absolute valuations, mm -hmm. but certainly relative to the risk-free rate. Uh, I think that uh, having minimal exposure to equities right now from a cyclical perspective makes imminent sense mm -hmm. to me. Well, I know for those watching, a lot of da David does so many things. He does it daily early daily and a daily, and he does all these interim things too. But one of the things you do is your strategizer, which comes with your service, which I think is great. But if I'm not, if I'm right, on, I think I'm right on this, that recent in the last couple of weeks, you went to zero yeah. on the stocks. It's a, it's a zero to 100 score. We cover all the asset classes, the equity sectors, currencies, commodities, um, treasuries, corporate credit, investment grade and high yield. Uh, we split gold out of the um, out of the commodity model. It's actually very dynamic, and then it it morphs into a uh, an asset mix recommendation at the end. So 100% right. Uh, we just published our uh, our it comes out monthly. Just published our latest strategizer, and we are at zero, which is sad to say. Max maximum bearish of the S and P 500. I can't put it, but guess what? You know what? It, it's 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 only bad if you're not prepared, right? Like, yeah. so if there's going to be, if it's going to rain outside, you know, bring an umbrella. So uh, what we're saying is that uh, the last time it was at zero, by the way, was at the end of 2021, right? And who right. was predicting in 2022 was a meat grinder of a market. So, you know, it ultimately bottomed October of that year. So uh, this isn't going to last forever, but uh, a very, very big warning sign coming from our stock market models. Do you think... Uh... And, and maybe maybe we could get a look at that uh, strategizer by chance from you, but we uh, you think this downturn would be worse than twenty two? Because you're at the same level basically. Uh, yeah, I would say that um, it, the reason why I think it could be worse, and um, you know, I know people just sort of like uh, you know grit their teeth, and uh, it could be worse because of where interest rates are. Right. But don't forget the last time we were here. At the end of 2021, um, the, the Fed hadn't even started tightening yet. I, I mean, yeah. we had, uh, I, I mean, the funds rate was close to zero. Uh, the Fed was still adding to its balance sheet. Uh, the 10 year note was like, you know, one and a half percent. So the relative valuations 
uh, to the risk-free rate or to the treasury market is so far out of whack today than compared to then. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, uh, and when you look at the table on what would equilibrate, and again, it's just math, what would equilibrate to mean revert the the uh, 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 the um, uh, uh, ERP, the equity risk premium, you know, uh, I said down 20%. It could be, uh, I think the table shows we could get down to 33, 3400. But, you know, Bob Farrell and I once, uh, I think, did a uh, did a breakfast together where uh, he said to the group, we're going to be down 10%. Uh, on the way back to the shop, I said, uh, I'm pretty sure at breakfast you told me privately we're going to be down 20. And so Bob said to me, well, uh, give them 10 now, give them 10 later. <laughs> well... It's a good part about that because uh, you know one of the good things about your forecast is you don't have many people, you don't have much company, so I think that's a plus usually in forecasting. By by the way, but one of the things I see, and I wanted to ask your opinion on this, is that I don't think I've ever seen, even in two thousand, I've never seen such concentration in the market. We had concentration then, but we covered more stocks. But yeah. this one's concentrated in just a few stocks. Even the foreign funds have a huge concentration in these seven stocks. So what, what are your thoughts there? Very worrisome. And again, to invoke uh, Bob Farrell's, one of his rules is about, uh, um, you know, that a, a healthy market is uh, defined by uh, broad participation. Uh, and we we have not had that for a while. Uh, now, it's true that the, the stock market got back towards the old highs very recently. Uh, and uh, that's the way markets move on emotion, uh, psychology, uh, and um, momentum. And uh, quite often, it can surprise you in both directions. I think it is a very dangerous market from a concentration standpoint. It's true that you had uh, a broadening out. If you if you strain your eyes, there's been a broadening out over the course of the past few months. But a lot of that was, you know, short coverings, especially uh, in the banks and some of the more value propositions. That was just a, a short covering, gives you a very powerful near-term effect. And, of course, I think it was predicated on the Fed easing policy more quickly than now they're saying they're willing to do. So I think that part of the market looks vulnerable. But these growth stocks are also, you know, they're they're trading at such expensive multiples. Yeah. So you have the concentration and then you have the valuation on top of that. And that's why I would say that, um, you know, uh, I am still investing in the stock market, but I am not blindly buying um, the S&P 500. Well, you've got uh, a good slide on that, too, by the way, on the sectors that correlate. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think that uh, you <laughs> look at it, I'm bullish on bonds. This is always a case, right, Ted, that uh, your assumptions drive your conclusions. So <laughs> my assumption is that I'm bullish on rates. <laughs> Therefore, if I'm in the equity market, I want to be in the uh, in the bond proxies, what I call the bonds and drag. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I mean, the utilities have been really beaten up, uh, but their yields are very attractive. They do well in a declining interest rate environment. They're typically defensive, so they don't usually get whacked in a recession. Uh, telecom, well, uh, they've done uh, better, but again, they are yield sensitive. Uh, there's select REITs. I mean, you want to be very selective within the REITs and especially about refinancing risk. However, they screen very well in a lower interest rate environment. And I would dare say uh, that uh, despite all the hair on the financials, um, you know, when you're trading down towards book value and the yield curve will at some point soon probably pivot to a more normal shape, the banks um, are going to be worth a good hard look this year as well. So there are areas to put money to work. Um, however, I would abstain from just blindly buying uh, the overall index. Yeah. Well, in addition to that, uh, and we own a number of these things you're talking about in staples and utilities, particularly yeah. we bought in the last five or six months. But, but even those, I think you would agree, all of that stuff will still go down some. And when you get in a bear market, so you it's, have to be it's a well, it, you know, for a lot of investors, it's a, it's a relative game. So yeah. if the market's down twenty five percent and they're down five, they're still going to basically, uh, you know, um, <laughs> shake your hand. Uh, so you in, the, in, the, in the in the land of the blind, the one eyed man is king. So you're quite right. I think yeah. that in the great in the great recession in the in the GFC, there was one stock, one stock in the S and P five hundred that did not lose you money, and it was uh, it was Walmart.
Oh, wow. Yeah, well, that's interesting. You know, um, so winding that up, and and by the way, three or four times during this series, we put up how to get in contact with you and your services. And uh, and I, I would recommend to people to, to try your service. I, I really feel like dollar for dollar, you put out as much content and much a lot of interesting things as anybody I know. So I put that on there. But to wind it up, uh, he had to tell people, okay, I'm just going to give you my personal advice on handling your money right now. What, what, what generally would you say to them? Well, I think that this is a year where you have to uh, think creatively and, and thematically. Uh, so I would say that what am I confident? I'm confident that we are at peak interest rates. And I don't think they're going to stay where they are. I think that uh, this first 100 basis points down on the 10-year Treasury note was an appetizer for the bigger meal. So I think that the Treasury market, especially the longer end, is going to deliver equity-like returns this year. I think that because I have a recession view, I know I'm really in the minority on that. Um, but I know that in recessions, uh, average median you're down at least 20 percent on the on the headline s p 500 so uh i i would you know i'd be very circumspect about the stock market uh now there's um i said to invest um you know thematically there's uh there's areas out there that i like a lot i think the u.s dollar bull market is over gold is priced in u.s dollars i, I like gold i like the gold mining stocks uh uranium uh, and, uh, I mean, if you look at the bellwether, uh, dr dr drop the chart of Cameco, uh, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, you know, uranium is in a sustainable bull market, part of this, uh, clean energy, uh, future, present and future. However, uh, the demand is strong and there's a deficiency of supply that's going to last for years. So there's something you can sink your teeth into. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, uh, food security, very important, uh, and I'd say that diversify internationally. Um, I, I, I think that there's three markets, maybe four, that were that we've been very bullish on. We've been bullish on India and Japan uh, for some time, and they have been their secular re-ratings for different reasons in both markets, mm -hmm. um, and Mexico and Brazil. Uh, so we, you know, look, uh, the, the 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 U.S. has forty percent of the global market cap. You know. However, there's another 60% out there that's liquid and that uh, is be having a fundamental re-rating uh, of um, their asset values that are worth taking a look at, too. Well, David, listen, uh, this has been fabulous. As always, uh, we love to have you each, each year and tell us what, what you think and give us all the information you do. But again, I want to thank you very, very much for being with us, and we look forward to having you again next year. Well, always a pleasure uh, being on your show, Ted. It's uh, it's an honor and it's a privilege uh, also to have you as a client. And for those uh, very kind words, I don't know if you can see me, but uh, I'm not wearing makeup and I'm blushing. So, uh, <laughs> well, thanks. All right. Thanks well, well, thanks a bunch. We'll see you. All the best. All right. You bet. Hello, everyone. I just want to say if you like this video and you want to see more of this type of information, because we really try to get the information that you don't see from anybody else, then be sure and click on subscribe and you'll see more of what we do here at Oxbow.